about to move into another another section here. Yeah, so while Paul is at Corinth, uh, he writes at least two epistles, and one of those is 1 Thessalonians. So when Paul comes back, or excuse me, when Silas and Timothy come back from Macedonia, uh, why did Paul send them there in the first place again? Silas and Timothy to, to, to Macedonia, to Thessalonica, to check on the brethren. When Timothy especially comes back, the word that Paul gets is the brethren are faithful. They're, they're holding strong. And so, but they have some questions. There are some concerns that they have. I would, that's reasonable given the fact that Paul was only able to spend a brief time with them. Not everything could have been covered in the time that he was with them. And so they, with, through Timothy, send back asking about some things that they don't have full understanding of. Uh, and yet, they're, even though they don't have a full picture, they're, they're being faithful in the face of great persecution. And so Paul writes this letter to the Thessalonians in order to do a couple of things. I think to encourage them in their faithfulness, but also to give them further instruction. And as Lonnie was talking about earlier, so he hadn't been there with them very long, and then he has to leave really abruptly. And I could imagine that that would be uh, the grounds for some criticism of Paul on the part of the Jews, right? Paul bailed when things got hard. He was just coming, and he was just uh, a snake oil salesman. He was peddling the gospel, and he's come. And then when things got difficult, he abandoned you to face all of this on your own. What kind of guy is he? Can you imagine the Jews saying that to discredit everything that Paul had done? And so Paul, in the first three chapters, I think is encouraging them, reminding them of who, what they have done, reminding them of the kind of ministry that Paul had among them, and in the second part saying... This is the way you need to live in the middle of a, a hostile, pagan, and persecuting culture. What are the kinds of things that Christians can focus on? And I think there's a lot of really good lessons for us because I, I, even though we don't face the same direct persecution that they did, there are a lot of parallels to our culture and the culture that the Thessalonians lived in. All right, so we're ready to begin 1 Thessalonians, the epistle of 1 Thessalonians. So uh, chapter 1. In verse 1, notice who the author of this letter is. Paul, Silvanius, and Timothy. Do you normally think about, if someone said, how many epistles did Silas write? What would, what would your answer be? <laughs> My answer might be none. He's not one of the authors of the New Testament epistles. Well, he's a co-author here. Uh, at least this message is, is from Paul, Silvanius, or Silas, and Timothy. And to the church of Thessalonica, Thess Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, did they have favor and peace in Thessalonica from the citizens there? No. But he says, you can have it from God. You can have it from God, and that's what really matters. And uh, it's a common way that he starts a lot of his epistles. But I think it would be meaningful to me if I was in Thessalonica to hear Paul say, you know, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, because I don't have much peace here, but I sure am thankful to have it with God. Yeah, so we can date the letter of 1 Thessalonians pretty closely, early 50s, like 50, 51, 52, something like that, because uh, in, 1 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, in Acts 18, verse 12, there's a, an official mentioned. That type of official served like a one-year term. And we know that he served 50, 51, 52, right there in that range. So we, this is one of those epistles that we can nail down pretty closely, probably in the early 50s uh, of Paul's ministry. And when he writes to them, notice that, so in the book of 1 Thessalonians, there are at least five prayers slash givings of thanks. And the first one shows up in verses 3 and 4. And what are the things that he gives thanks about the Thessalonians for? Their faithfulness, right? So notice he uses three phrases here. Uh, rem we give thanks to God, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your, what's the last one? Your patience or your steadfastness of hope. That you're holding on in view of the hope that you have. We're going to talk a lot about that hope as we go through. We're going to talk about love in the, in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And those things, uh, I think, will be recurring themes. Verse 4, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Uh, and that gets into this first section of, 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 the, of the book, 
which is Paul remembering his work among the Thessalonians. And chapter 1, verses 4 through 10 is remembering the way that the Thessalonians themselves had responded to the message that was preached. Uh, Paul is encouraging them by reminding them of what they had done when they obeyed the gospel. Before we get, yeah. get into that, just one comment about verse 3, this idea of faith, love, and hope. Uh, how important is it for them in the setting that they're in, in Thessalonica, with the persecution, to have faith? What would you say is faith? Your confidence. And, and, and not in the visible, but the invisible, right? What's the visible? Man, I'm making my life miserable. <laughs> I'm making my life tough by being a Christian. What's the invisible? What's my faith? Yeah, but I, I have peace with God. I have peace with God. All right, love. Why do you think love would be something that would be of high importance? Do they have a lot of love from the city? No, but do they need to have a lot of love for each other? Absolutely, for a number of reasons. But, you know, I think we appreciate that type of... When, when, when we're at peace with everybody around us, I think the love of the brethren doesn't register as significant as it probably should. But when the world is really after us, boy, our brethren and our love of the brethren is so vital and so important. We recognize it more. It's always vital, but we recognize it more. And then the idea of our hope, well... What was their hope in Thessalonica? Not, yeah, not very good. Uh, but they were looking for something better. That's what hope is. It's the expectation of something better in the future. All right, I just want to make those, those points. So as you look through this first chapter, Paul says in verse 4, We know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. How does he know that God chose these people? What's the evidence for that? Okay, he was sent there. That's right. So, yeah, so he was called to go to Macedonia. They were obedient. That's it. So notice this verse 5. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. The way that they showed that they were the people that God had chosen was that when they heard the message of the gospel, they left their old life behind, they turned to the one true and living God, and they changed the direction of their focus, not to the here and now, but to what was coming in the future. They were waiting on, G on, on Jesus, God's Son from heaven, because He was going to deliver them from the wrath to come. So notice they turned, they served, and they waited. So he, the gospel, as a result, had changed their past, had changed their present, and was changing their future, changing what they were looking forward to. The gospel had them completely, inside and out. That's how Paul knew they were people who were chosen by God, because of the way that they responded to the message that he preached. Any thoughts, comments? Just notice that Paul recognizes the situation they're in. Verse 6, you became followers of us in much affliction. You received the word in much affliction, with joy. And, uh, and so he, he, he recognizes what they're going through here. But then notice verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven, talking about that, that future hope. It's interesting that uh, we're going to have that idea come up so frequently in this first epistle. Matter of fact, the, the chapters are going to end with that note. Every one of them. Every one of yeah. them is going to end with the note of you're waiting for the, the, the return of Christ. Which that will get you through a lot. That will get you through a lot, recognizing that that's, that's coming. I think my computer died. Well, I know it died. I think it died because of a low battery. I'll plug it in. <laughs> that sounds like a solution. All right, any comments uh, for the third chapter one? All right. Um, 
looking at chapter 2. He's going to talk about how he conducted himself among them. Uh, Larson made mention that maybe there was accusations being made as far as, uh, you know, that Paul was just kind of a fly-by-night uh, salesman that came in and trying to make a profit off of, the, off of the gospel. There definitely seems to be... Pulling my cord here. That's all right. Uh, I, I can move it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, There definitely seems to be a defense that Paul is making here. He seems to be answering some type of accusations that have been made against him in this. And uh, so you notice in verse 3, For our exhortation did not come from deceit or uncleanness, uh, nor was it in guile. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, who tests our hearts. Neither at any time do we use flattering words, as you yourselves know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, neither from you nor from others, when we might have been made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, as a nurturing mother cherishes her own children. He's going to use that idea of his, his approach to them. His approach was not that he was trying to get something from them, but his approach was that he was, as a parent, nurturing them. Trying to lovingly trying to bring them to maturity. You may be wanting to outline that on there, so I don't know. It's up I, there. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, as he remembers his works among the Thessalonians, first is their reception and his labor. Uh, and, and I think that what he asks them to do is just, just think about the way we acted among you. Did we act like people who were only in it for the money? Well, obviously that's not true. They labored in order to be able to, to work with them. Did they act like people who were trying to take advantage of them? No, they treated them like parents caring for their little children. Uh, and all of that should have just... So you, you can imagine the it, Paul's not there to defend himself personally, and maybe doubts would creep in these people's minds. Like, have we abandoned something that was right? Like, if they're a Jewish Christian or if they're a, a god fear, have we abandoned something that was true for something that was just a, a made-up thing? And Paul is trying to encourage them by remembering the kind of labor that they had done. There may also be a part of that at the end of verse 5 uh, in chapter 1 where he says, in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. It's very possible that what Paul's referring to there are the signs that accompanied the teaching that he was doing. And would that have been possible if he had just been somebody who was uh, it, just you know, coming in and, and making something up in order to take advantage of them? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and then... Yeah, so, and then especially in verse uh, 12, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. His goal in this was not to take advantage of them, but to call them to a higher standard of living. This idea that they could be worthy of God uh, is really a, an amazing concept to grasp. And they weren't worthy of God because they were perfect. They, were, they could be worthy of God because they responded in obedience to the gospel that they heard that they could be forgiven and they could be transformed by obedience to the Word. And I think we'll see more of that concept as we go through the book of Thessalonians because there is no doubt that these people were radically changed. Well, how did God accomplish that? What means did He use to accomplish that? And Paul will say it was the message that we preached. It doesn't seem that Paul was there very long. And so how much opportunity did they get to see his character? Well, he worked pretty diligently with them during the time that he was there, so they got to see quite a bit of it there. But also you notice that he's saying, we, Timothy and Silas were there on other occasions and uh, were there longer perhaps. And so uh, he includes, you know, they're included in this. You, you saw how, how we conducted ourselves, not just Paul, but also Timothy and Silas in this as well. All right, anything through verse 12? Yes. yes, that's right. That's right. They became examples, and uh, he's going he's gonna to point that out. I have done this before. But I don't know. Um, it may not seem like it. Uh, all right. Uh, there's a, a, a giving of thanks in chapter 2 that I think in some ways makes a transition. What is he thankful for in verses 13 through 16? That they receive the word. How? That it's from God, not as it really is, from God and not from men. And what was the result of them receiving the word like that? 
What was it doing? Do what? Worked in them. It was what? Yes, that's right. Which works in you who believe. God's word has power to work inside of us if we put our confidence in it. If we accept it as what it really is, the word of God, not the word of men. And that's indicated, he says, for, because, how do I know that, that it's working in you? You became, and you said this a minute ago, Mr. Tim, you became imitators of us, of the church of God in Christ Jesus there in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. The way he knew that God's word was working them effectively was that they were maintaining their faithfulness even in the face of severe persecution. And when they did that, they were imitating the first disciples of Jesus. They were imitating Jesus himself. And they were imitating Paul and Silas and Timothy who had labored among them and had showed them that, that path of endurance in the face of hostility. Just a little side note on this. It seems to me, based upon the way that, that this is worded, uh, you suffer the same thing from your own countrymen just as they did from the Jews. All right, so who was it that stirred up the trouble in Thessalonica to begin with? The Jews. Mm -hmm. But the trouble's continuing from their fellow countrymen there. And, of course, I know the Jews were the fellow countrymen too, but it seems to be a contrast mm -hmm. here. And so the, the persecution, the, the Jews started it, but the persecution has been carried on by, by, the, uh, by the Gentiles there in Thessalonica as well. Any other thoughts through verse 16? All right, so verse 17. But we... Somebody have something? Yes. Yeah, that's right. If they were just trying to please man, they wouldn't have lasted. No. That's right. Very good. So verse 17. But we, brethren, having taken away, uh, been taken away from you for a short time in present, but not in heart, endeavoring more eagerly to see your face with great desire, therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered me. All right, so when Paul was at Athens, wherever did he really like to have been? He's really worried about those Christians in Thessalonica. I wish I could, but he couldn't leave. And uh, now he's at Corinth, and the work is going really well at Corinth. And, uh, and he's, he's not leaving Corinth. All this. So he's saying, there were occasions where I wanted to come. I haven't left in, in, in heart, in spirit, but I haven't been there with you at present. And, and so in verse 19 he says, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. And so he says, the reason that my heart's gone out to you is because I really want you to make it. I really want you to see it. As a matter of fact, my success depends upon you making it. And so he's completely invested here in them. So at the beginning of chapter 3, what does Paul do because of his concern? He can't come. Satan's hindered him. So what, what does he do? He sends Timothy. Now, I love this idea because we talked about when Paul picks up Timothy back in chapter 16 that he's probably in his late teens, maybe in his early 20s. And Paul sends him back to be the one, notice the end of verse 2, to establish and exhort you in your faith. Right? We talk a lot, and I think reasonably so, about the need to establish people in that age group to exhort them and establish them in their faith. Yeah, that's true. We need to do that. The, Timothy was already at the position where Paul is entrusting him the responsibility of going and doing that for people who were already pretty, pretty steadfast, pretty, pretty uh, um, bold people who were able to be... And, and Timothy could be a help to them. So I think, um, you know, we've, we've got some young people in that age group here. I think we should raise our expectations for ourselves uh, and, and parents should have higher expectations for their children and what they should be at the end of their teen years and in their early 20s. They should be people who we could send to somewhere like Thessalonica and they could encourage them and exhort them in their faith. Now, obviously, present company included. We, we don't live up to that standard. And yet, that's, that's a goal to attain to, to be the kind of person who, uh, who could be an encouragement to other brethren who are facing really difficult circumstances and enduring in that. Yeah. Ty, Trey, y'all want to go to Afghanistan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, when you think about what's really being asked of Timothy here, it is 
pretty amazing what what you know his his faith in going to this very hostile uh, environment and being able to spiritually encourage them. Yeah, so look at verse 5. He sent to learn about their faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be vain. So there are a couple of things I want to know about that. First of all, Paul is concerned that they will be lost, that, that, that Satan is going to get a hold of them. The very fact that that's a possibility, I think, answers some bad ideas that are out there. But also, he wants to catch them before it's too late. He thinks there are some things that he can do to encourage them, and so he sends Timothy back to them. But even though that was maybe worst-case scenario, and Paul thought it was possible, what is the actual news that he gets back from Timothy in verses 6 through 10? It's good news. That's right. What, what, what kind of... What are they doing? They have faith and they have love. Right? Paul was thankful for that in verses 3 and 4. He says, We heard that you have faith, you're trusting in God, that you have love for one another, that you remember us kindly. Right? So he's writing maybe to answer some uh, criticisms that he's received, but the Thessalonians aren't buying it. They know the kind of people that Paul and Silas and Timothy were. And he says, For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So hearing the news about the Thessalonians was such an encouragement to Paul that even in the face of distress and affliction, he found joy. So, in verse 11, he says... We have this, this another prayer. And uh, in verse 11, he says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may God make you to increase and abound in what? Love to one another and to all just as we do to you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in what? Holiness. Hold on to that idea because he's really going to hammer away at this idea of them being holy. That's what God wants for us. It's to be holy. In holiness before God our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of the saints. All right, so we mentioned the end of chapter 1, who wait for his Son from heaven. End of chapter 2, he talks about our hope and our joy. Uh, is, 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 it's in you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. End of chapter 3, he talks about this idea that, uh, that you may be established in holiness before God at the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. This idea of our hope for Christ is, is the idea, if we're being persecuted here, the idea of deliverance from this. But what else is involved? We're delivered from the persecution that we're facing here, but what else awaits us when Christ comes? A reward. A reward. And so there's this anticipation that's here. And you see that building. And I'll tell you, I've mentioned this before as we've gone through here. I, we struggle sometimes, I think, with anticipating the Lord's return. And maybe it's because we're too comfortable here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we need to be reminded of what, what it's going to be. We're going to be delivered from the things that torment us here, and we're going to be rewarded for our faithfulness. And so Paul is just bringing that up to him. That's how we remain faithful. That's part of the motivation. And we need every bit of the motivation we can get to be faithful. And so I think that it's okay to be motivated by, well, I don't want to be found lacking when the Lord comes. We know what happens to those who are not faithful to the gospel when the Lord returns. We don't want to be on that side. But then there's also the anticipation when He does come. For those who are faithful, we're going to get to be with Him. And we're going to get to leave the oppression of this world behind. And so he, He's bringing that to their attention, calling that to mind so they can keep their eye on the, on the goal, on the end result. They can keep that hope that He's talked about. So I think this prayer kind of serves as a bridge between the two sections, right? He's talked about his desire to see them in the first three chapters. He longs to be there. He, he's separated from them, longs to be with them. He mentions that at the beginning of his prayer, that Jesus would direct his way to him. But also, he kind of previews what he's going to talk about the rest of the letter. You've got love, holiness, and hope. And as you read these chapters in preparation for Wednesday night, notice how often those themes come up in the next two chapters. Uh, but we're going to have to leave those for Wednesday night because we're out of time. Any final thoughts, comments, questions? Do you have 
An, a possible answer? No. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, so, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think uh, the persecution that was there and the fact that Paul was the focus of that persecution. Obviously, the Thessalonians were suffering too, but they made sure they got Paul out. And even, like, he felt comfortable sending Silas and Timothy back and not himself. So I think the idea there is not that Paul was... I don't think Paul would have been unwilling... Let, let me see if I can say this how I want to. Because Silas and Timothy could do the job, he was willing to send them and not go himself. He really wanted to be there himself. And if their salvation had depended on it, I think Paul would have gone himself. But he could send Silas and Timothy and not be there himself. Uh, and so in that way, Satan had hindered him from coming, even though he was still able to accomplish, I think, what he wanted to in encouraging them. Does that make sense? I think the persecution is the, the major thing there. Anything else? All right. Thank you for the good attention. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.